Hello, I'm Colin Green, and you are listening to Spike Pit. Right, let's have a go at this walking and talking malarkey then. Part of the fitness drive, guys. Sun's boxing. Why am I sitting recording podcasts when I could be out on the hills, getting in a few steps and talking into my phone at the same time? Absolutely no reason at all. So here we are, beautiful sunny day. Blows downs, moving across some quite interesting topography. Actually, we've got these, what are they, lynchets or something like that, where the um, medieval farmers kind of terraced the land a little bit. I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here. It's uh, now a site of special scientific interest. Rather splendid. That warm light that you get at the end of summer and the view of the Dunstable Downs and the golf club in the distance, looking over Dunstable Town, uh, making my way back to the boxing gym. And from there, we go gaming, back in Ravenloft, DM Ricky, running, and then next week, we make up characters for reboot.execute, which is an RPG that my youngest, He's going to run for us, so we're going to do like a session zero. I've made up a character that, that can be changed, but just to kind of um, engage my son a little bit, I said I'd generate a character. So he's not going in cold with the rest of the group. And, and that was good fun. I've got like a cyborg sort of fellow called Chunk. Great big lump of a guy. Um, not, not something I normally play. I like to play some different characters. I've just uh, generated a character for uh, Warhammer, uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Getting that, going to be playing that on Saturday. Um, I think, I'm not actually too sure what's planned for Saturday. All I know is I'm, I'm keen to get started in Salzmunden in the uh, Empire. Got a lot of gaming in, board gaming, especially my eldest. Uh, is getting a bit of a board game purchasing problem, I think. <laughs> it's sort of, um, yeah, it seems to be quite a lot of that runs in the family. And uh, he has, thankfully, started moving on some of them games. So he's kind of buying them in, playing them, shifting them on, keeping his favourites. I continue with my purge been watching a little bit and listening to the minimalists again which is a podcast i used to listen to years back and they have some good ideas for helping you get rid of stuff not everybody's cup of tea some of us are collectors some of us are kind of collectors not through choice and i feel like i fall into that category anyway the health regime goes well still off the drink giving up the caffeine Low carb, diet, high protein, uh, and we'll we'll see how that goes. At the moment, month in, feeling pretty good. I think I'd like to say that I've got a bit more energy, but eh, could could be kidology. Who knows? Another podcast I come across is a great one. Uh, I've been looking into adult ADHD, ADD, and a a friend of mine I was talking to pointed me in the direction of a podcast and a book called The Drummer and The Great Mountain. All I can say is it's really pretty amazing, pretty amazing how things are explained, they take the idea of neurodiversity and really dial it to the max, taking what is potentially described as a kind of a um, deficit or a disorder and turn it into a different wiring they think of it as a different wiring for your brain and they take a theory called the hunter and the farmer theory this is not the creation of the author 
but when you think about the reasoning behind the theory of the hunter and the farmer and evolution uh, for, a, for a pretty simple guy like myself it just kind of makes sense and does away with the neg negative associations of a disorder and if you think of it as just another type of diversity and neurological diversity we hear about diversity all the time but I'm not so sure we hear about neurological diversity that much and this was a this has been a really refreshing podcast and a refreshing read a real insightful look at practical ways of making the most of this kind of mindset and um, neurological structure in a brain uh, uh, and making taking that taking what you got and making it work in a modern world i've done a really bad job of explaining that but the author of this book and i forget his name um, does it so well so well and it's kind of a compendium it draws a lot of thinking and research together it was four years in the making because the guy himself describes himself as a hunter type and yeah anybody interested in that that kind of um, topic that I, I can uh, I can strongly recommend it Colin sorry to hear about you losing your notes but you forgot the best thing about Google Drive and that's its search this thing searches crazy like I had a piece of paper that I printed out from a book and I took a phrase from that paper threw it into Google search and it found the PDF for me. That search is freaking crazy on Google Drive. I actually left Google Drive for a while for something way cheaper and way bigger, but I came back to Google Drive because I missed that search. Good hearing from you, take it easy. Well, it's been a while since we've heard from Rich Fraser of Cockatrice Nuggets. And I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Rich. I like his style in terms of preparation. And whenever I talk about Google and Google Slides or a bit of tech, and he's, um, he's quite often called in, and, and this time is no different. Leaping into the for the defence of Google Drive, he's, he's gone away from it, as, as you can hear, and he's come back to it. And, of course, you know, I made a bad job of trying to find my notes. And I'm not entirely sure the Google Drive search would have actually helped me this time. Um, and not that I'm suggesting that Rich is mistaken in any way. Uh, he's a bit of an early adopter and he, he jumps into this tech with, with both feet and has given me actually loads of ideas over the years. But my problem was I was in the wrong Google account. Now, I don't know if... I, I can't imagine there's a way that you can search across the accounts, but if I just didn't twig it, and what I should have done was, of course, if I'd have just swapped accounts or searched all my accounts, I've only got three, but if I'd have searched all three, I would have come across it. But I, I just, I just didn't think of it at the time. Sometimes when I run in, when I run a game, I do get in this little bit of an almost deer in the headlights panic state. In fact, just lately, with the teaching, I, I, I feel I'm getting a little bit more calm under pressure when it comes to technology. It's sort of like, um, well, just getting flustered, really, is how I describe it. And, and I'm all right when I can work at my own pace, but when you're, kind of, you're being watched, you've got an audience, or there's sort of people waiting for you, you just feel that pressure, and I, I just, I, I don't know why, just tend to go to pieces a little bit. But I won't let that stop me. I'll get back in there, and I, I am gradually getting more comfortable with these uh, these methods of working and, and this technology. I was really pretty much out of it for years, and it's all moved on. Um, and I don't think that's helped me at all. But you're absolutely right, Rich. That is a great search function. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm also terrible at using search functions in, in general, just in my day-to-day -day work. I always forget to search and I see colleagues doing it all the time, this whole control F business was a, was a revelation to me. Um, and, and shortcuts in general, I'm atrocious with shortcuts. But when you can get this stuff down and you can get it working smooth, I'm really quite enjoying running my adventures off, off of a laptop. I'd probably like to run them off of something like a, a little iPad or a tablet, perhaps. Sometimes I think that, that screen, when you're using a laptop, you kind of got that screen up. And that feels, feels like a little bit of a barrier in the way that I've... I felt uh, a, a DM screen for me was a little bit of a barrier and I found it quite um, liberating to be rid of my DM screen. But, oh dear, I don't want to don't wanna cause any contention and I know, oh, DM screens, that's dangerous territory. So, Rich, please don't tempt me there. Don't tempt me into that dangerous territory. I thought I'd take a little bit of a break from reading and catch up on a couple of things I'd heard about on Netflix. Now the first of them is a, one of these what they call docudramas called The Social Dilemma. What this film is about is how the big social media companies bore into your mind at a subconscious level basically. It's quite, well for me, uh, and probably others, you hear about this stuff and, and kind of conspiracy theories, but the interesting thing about the, the way this was done, they got various former employees of the big names and kind of interviewed them about their thoughts and feelings on a number of issues the sort of um, the risk to kids kids getting hold of social media at a young age and how it potentially is damaging their self image it looks at some facts and figures that are quite worrying it then looks at the business model and how consumers or users as they call them are in fact the product and you know none of this stuff is actually free it's just that the advertisers pay and you are the product that the likes of say Google are offering to the advertiser and it talks about this and it looks at some of the really kind of underhanded methods that are used and it's really quite clever and I found it to be fascinating and then it talks about the potential for election rigging talks about the American elections in, in 2016 delves into that a little bit and looks at polarization and the breakdown of society and discusses discusses some of these um, some of the theories behind uh, the idea that social media and the internet if handled wrongly and the, the way it's been used at an the moment is potentially this existential threat. So it's quite heavy, it's quite heavy going, uh, not for everybody, but I found it really quite um, fascinating. I couldn't tear myself away. And if you're interested, yeah, The Social Dilemma on Netflix. I, I, it's a few years old now, so I would like to see something perhaps a little bit more up to date at this point. But, yeah, the, the, the rate of change and everything else is just staggering. And there's some real eye-openers in there. I mean, me, I'm not super tech-savvy when it comes to social media. I try and steer clear of it. But I do see the effect um, of mass consumption at a young age in, in the context that I work in with the kids. So, yeah. On a lighter note, I also watched something called In the Eye of the Beholder. And it's, it's also on Netflix. And this is all about the art 
uh, the fantasy art in particular from D and D. I mean, as documentaries go, you could kind of say it's probably not the best, but if you're a fan, they have packed loads of the artwork into this. It's almost a, a bit of a slide presentation at times, but some fascinating insight. You get to see, put put faces to some of this artwork, names that I'm so familiar with or at least I thought I was and then I realised I didn't actually know what the artist looked like and I just kind of it was sort of an assumed familiarity if, if you see what I mean if that makes sense you, you think you know all these people really well because you've been looking at all their drawings all this time and of course you don't I mean some of them I, I just didn't even know what the people looked like uh, however Ralph Horsley was on there He's a British artist, and we actually got to meet him this year at UK Games Expo. I specifically went along and took my youngest son so that he could enjoy the whole experience in the knowledge that we'd probably run into some, you know, fairly well-known illustrators at, at the convention. And sure enough, we did. He also got to meet a guy called Sarastro, who's a big miniature painter that he really admires and he, he he spent ages chatting with him he even went back there and got a photo with him later on in the day uh, so that that was great and art and illustration and painting being his thing um and never been never been to a big convention you know this was a real a real great experience i'm glad i took him along uh, and, and we sat and watched that together. We saw some sort of like concept art, some sketches, some tales about the uh, the changeover from TSR to Wizards and like the departure of Gary Gygax. Um, and, and, you know, it touched on a few of the, the things about the, the lack of an understanding in the latter days of TSR from the management to the creatives and the kind of disconnect but they didn't they didn't really kind of like dwell on any of that stuff it really was about the art and the the importance of the imagery and the influential nature of the work now you might find neither of these to be to your taste but i thoroughly enjoyed both and hope perhaps you try them out take a look hey colin jason here as far as your question about the podcasters use their podcast to help verbally organize their thoughts? Uh, probably. I, I know I'm an external processor, which drives my wife crazy, but I know that's kind of why I'm drawn to do these calls and to do my podcast and do all that kind of thing. So as far as the fact that you, you know, maybe had a couple not great experiences recently, but you recognize that and you can get back in it, you know, get back on that horse and it's, no reason to stop gaming. And I know you're not planning on stopping gaming, but yeah, it's interesting to look back at that and try to take those lessons. But I think it's also good not to be too hard on ourselves when we have a bad session or, you know, have a bump in the road because that happens to everybody. We're only human after all. And the, the key is to learn from those things and, and to move forward. And I, I don't know, you've been struggling with your ICRPG for a little while now. Maybe it is time to just shelve it for a little bit and switch to a different system. I I know the desire to get it right before you move on can be a strong one sometimes. But, it, I mean, if it's not working, then it's not working. It's okay to admit that and say it was a noble experiment and for whatever reason, you know, maybe revisit it later. And even if ICRPG, being the great toolbox that it is, is just something that you pull ideas and insp inspiration from, then it's still a great toolbox and it still served its purpose. So I'll just throw that out there. Now I'm always grateful to my callers for their contributions. And in particular to Mr. Connolly, I am more than grateful for this calling for a number of reasons. So I'll, I'll get to them straight away. Firstly, yeah, external processing. I'm, I'm intrigued now why this drives Jason's wife nuts. I'm, I'm not sure what he's doing around the house in terms of 
external processing, but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I don't know if he's talking to himself or is he leaving little memos everywhere or is he perhaps doing graffiti on the on the kitchen cupboards? I'm not sure, but he's driving her crazy. Whatever it is, perhaps we will find out another time. I, I jest, of course, um, but I am, I am intrigued. I'm sure there's no graffiti in the kitchen. Myself, I... I think I'm going to start doing some journaling. I think that might be where I take this external processing next. Podcasting is one thing, but just lately I've been doing a load of mind mapping much more. And for a while I'd stopped doing lists because I felt it was helping my memory to actually try and remember some of these lists. Um, and that's all right up to a point, but I realised... The list making and the mind maps are, are a little bit of a, a an externalising process, and I, I, I'm thinking I, I feel like I've been making a little bit more progress by returning to them a little bit. It's it's a little bit of a balancing act, but yeah, journaling, some lists, some mind maps, podcasting, and recording voice memos seems to be the way to go for me and it sounds like I share that perhaps a little bit with Jason although as far as I know I'm not driving my wife crazy well not with that anyway the other thing Jason mentions is the ICRPG and he is right of course sometimes you've got to know when to quit but and I did take on board what he had to say and I was thinking yeah maybe he's right maybe I just call it a day there for a little while but for whatever reason it turns out I scheduled another game in order to bring this story arc to a close and it I'm pleased to report it went really well it was a great final session got the pacing perfect I got loads of the right aspects of ICRPG coming into play, so the, the timers, threats and treats, the danger, energy and wonder, the um, kind of dialing up the difficulty to, to, to build tension on the, the target difficulty on the... So I've got a big dice where I, I set a, a difficulty target and basically in ICRPG, this, this target is king. Whatever's happening, that's what the players need to roll, whether it's combat or, or any other task. You've got this target number, and, and I was just notching it up. I had all my timers going, following one after the other. Um, the pacing was really good. I, I kept the turns moving around the table, just flowing um, clockwise around the table. Just, just all, all the ICR, ICRPG stuff that I've talked about, and it, it just came together. It was a blast. We had some really tense moments. My brother's character nearly got killed, ripped apart by a couple of these kind of... Um, what did I call them now? Uh, well, they're harpies, but they were beefed-up harpies that were sort of like guard harpies. Um, the whole thing, I did this... Um, uh, matriarchal structure uh, up on harpy heights this kind of honeycomb of caves off of a plateau um, uh, and I've, I've talked about the story before the the the, the matriarch has, has got this kind of evil gem for an eye she's got some kind of almost like priestess type harpies that are, are uh a close bodyguard, you've got three of them. Then you've got these other kind of big enforcer type harpies. There was there was ten of those. Then there was another thirty, I believe. Kind of hunter forager type quite fit harpies that were combatants. And then I believe it was sixty younger and old infirm type of harpies anyway 
I'm not going. I won't. I won't bore you with all the details, but it it was a a great finishing, a great finale to the story. They they came back with some villagers in a kind of a dawn raid type of situation. They poisoned the water supply for the harpies, scaled up into their abode. Um, there was carnage from from the poisonings up on the on the plateau where these harpies live I, I i feel like i did some decent exposition explaining what was what and some descriptive language but i didn't drag it out the players had plenty of time to do a few kind of ability checks but it wasn't prolonged and and we it just kind of the pacing just seemed right tense moments loads of action a satisfying conclusion to the story with a little bit of a mini cliffhanger at the end as one of the party, my son, who's who's playing this um, kind of reincarnated sorceress type of character that possessed his other character and he's, he, he wanted to get back. So the... The rest of the party had a noble defence of the villagers in mind and, and, and getting rid of these harpies meant a secure future for the villagers, the, the captives they'd previously freed. And my son's character was a, a little bit more of a shady character and he was actually after this gem that the matriarch of the harpies had. It's like this kind of bloodstone with sort of a vampiric ray type of powers and generally life-preserving powers. Kind of if you think of how the dark crystal in that film works, it, it draws the life out of the um, the innocent, uh, what are they, podlings? I, I want to say podlings. Draws the life from those guys and then and, and the Skeksis absorb it. Well, this harpy character, I feel like was... Um, my idea for that character was influenced by the Dark Crystal and, and that story there with this life-draining gem, albeit on a smaller scale. Anyway, so that, that was all sorted out. I was pleased with how it goes, chatting with my son in the car on the way back. He enjoyed it, and now I feel like I can rest having left that game on the up, which was what I wanted to do, and I just weren't sure it was going to happen. We now move to my son running his game. We've made up characters. Uh, Reboot Execute. It's um, I mentioned it before. It's this kind of little-known game played by a bunch of folks that he he watches on YouTube, I believe. And it's kind of cyberpunk. We haven't. I don't think we've ever really played cyberpunk in our group. Uh, in fact, I played some cyberpunk stuff with Jason, and that was using IC, an ICRPG offshoot. Um, can't remember what it's called now. Anyway, it's not important. But had a really good game of that with Jason, and would have liked to have played some more of that. In fact, but you know, these fi these things. You know how these things are. Doesn't always work that way. I think the highlight moment in the in our cyberpunk game with Jason was when Barney of Loco Ludos managed to throw a grenade. I think it hit a door frame or something and bounced back on us. Um, we managed to dodge the blast somehow, but I'm, I'm pretty sure Barney's character was caught in the blast, but some fluke of luck saved him. Um, but that was really <laughs> that was quite hilarious at the time. So, yeah, yeah, f thanks for the call, Jason. Of course, he, he needs no introduction. Jason Connolly of the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. And that, as they say, is a wrap. Big thanks goes out to you, the listener, for taking a bit of time out of your day to listen to old Spike Pit. Take care, and I'll catch you later.